Good evening. Welcome to the OBJ Library. We have had some rewarding evenings in this library, often with distinguished visitors from around the country. But tonight is something special. For tonight, we salute one of our own. I was not here in the fabled days of Webb and Betacek and Dobie, so I don't have the memory of sharing in that time of Austin's glory. But it has been my good fortune to be here in the heyday of another legend. And living in this city has been a richer experience than it would otherwise have been because of it. There is a bench down on Town Lake dedicated to Cactus Pryor. And it carries a plaque that bears a very simple but eloquent inscription, which says, he brought laughter to this town. And so he did. And he has brought so many other things as well. Civility, a finely honed conscience, a lively mind, a flair for drama, and a talent that goes on and on. It is a matter of considerable personal satisfaction to me that this evening with Cactus Pryor, which we have so long wanted to have here in this library, has finally come, and that I have the privilege of presenting him to you, Austin's own Mr. Bojangles. Thank you, Harry. Columnist Liz Smith says Harry Middleton is the sexiest man in Austin, Texas. <laughs> Columnist Liz Smith never met Willie Kosurik. <laughs> Gosh, I'm, I'm really delighted to see such a large crowd here. This being April Fool's Day, I figured you might have, have thought it was one of my practical jokes. And, and it may be. <laughs> Listen, uh, this is going to be a little different than the programs we usually have. And first of all, there's going to be not a thing profound, but uh, it's going to be very casual. We're going to have a good time. So let's get to know either, each other. So when I say three, please turn around and shake hands with the person behind you. One, two, three. <laughs> uh -huh. It, it only works on the last row, does it? <laughs> well, we're going to kind of have um, Texas uh, hash this evening. We're going to tell a lot of stories. Uh, I'm going to do a commercial. I can't go 10 minutes without a commercial. <laughs> Mrs. Johnson established that in our relationship very early. And uh, I, I forewarn you, I'm going to sing a song. I forewarn you, I'm going to read an original poem. I don't know why I warn you, we've got to lock the doors anyway. And then we're going to have some uh, moving pictures. I would um, like to tell you that it's always a pleasure to have Mrs. Johnson in my audience. You are my favorite audience, Mrs. Johnson, because uh, first of all, you laugh so well, even when it's nervous laughter when I'm telling a political story. <laughs> Like the story <laughs> of uh, after the election, George Bush and Bill Clinton and Ross Perot were playing golf and kind of heal over the election wounds. And they're playing on this beautiful golf course. And it was a lovely day, and they're having a very good time. But there was a foursome in front of them that were just indescribably slow. So at the end of uh, nine holes, they went in the pro shop, and uh, President Bush said, um, I don't want to complain. Uh, we're having a wonderful time. I like your, your, your country club. I like the fact that it's integrated. That's very important. And uh, I think you've done a good job with the environment. But there are four men playing in front of us, and they're just very, very slow. They really are. And I wonder if you could do something to speed them up a little bit. And the pro said, I'm, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. President. I should have told you this is Tuesday, and Tuesday's the day we let 
the four blind members of our club play on the course. And uh, I'll get them off the course. Oh, no, 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 stay the course, stay the course. Uh, I think that's laudable. I still believe in a kinder and gentler America. Uh, no, 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 it's uh, stay the course. And President Clinton said, well, I don't think you're doing enough for those fellows. I think what you need to do is to levy a fee on the wealthy members of the club and build those fellows their own golf course so they can play any time they want to. <laughs> Ross Perot said, well, I think that's silly. I think it's stupid. I think that's nothing but a bunch of hogwash. What you need to do is make me president of this club, and I'll make those guys play at night. <laughs> As I said, I, I love having Mrs. Johnson in my audience. Uh, I, she's been part of my audience ever since the mid-40s. Uh, uh, she and Lucy, well, Lucy came a little later. Uh, but uh, I've always appreciated the fact that uh, she has allowed me to, to entertain. And Mrs. Johnson, I would Carrie, if you'd come up and give me a little hand on the piano, my daughter Carrie, uh, I would like to sing a song, one of your favorite songs, but I've changed the lyrics just a little bit, if you don't mind. If ever I would leave you, it wouldn't be for Kvet. <laughs> Knowing that at Kvet, Sam Allred is there, nor for Waxahachie, nor Houston or Kyle, nor Alice or Corpus. For I tried them a while. If ever I would leave you, it wouldn't be for TV. Knowing that in TV I'd need some new hair. No, never in autumn, summer, winter, or fall. No, never would I leave you at all. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. No, as a matter of fact, next year I will celebrate the 50th anniversary of coming to work with this lady. And uh, back in the, the 40s, when the Johnson family would have parties up at the, the ranch, they were kind enough to invite me to come up and bring some entertainment. And usually the guest list was made mostly of the Weinheimers and Bergs, and they pretty hard to avoid in the Stonewall area, and you wouldn't want to anyway. But then over the years, as, uh, as uh, the congressman's career ascended, the guest list grew a little bit too, and uh, the cotton got a little bit taller and I was still allowed to, to chop in that cotton. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time. I'll never forget the time I got a call from Liz Carpenter. And she said, uh, the vice president is giving a party and a barbecue for the president of Pakistan. And we want you to come up and MC the barbecue and let's get some appropriate entertainment for the occasion. Well, the first thing I did was to go to the library and look up Pakistan to see what it was. <laughs> learned that it was a country. And we decided since it was going to be a barbecue that it would uh, probably call for some Western type entertainment. So we called Nashville and asked Eddie Arnold if he would come and entertain. Well, he was just delighted, thrilled at the prospect of being able to come to the LBJ Ranch and entertain. Matter of fact, he came down two days early for the occasion, uh, wrote a song especially for it, and uh, was really enthused about it. Well, it was a wonderful, wonderful setting as usual. Uh, the Pertinalis flowing gracefully by and the huge oak trees and Walter Jatan with his little chuck wagon there roasting the, an ox and uh, the barbecued ribs uh, filling the air with their pungent odor and uh, sourdough biscuits. And we had bales of hay set all over the place and the cowboys and the, 
the, the people from Pakistan, the women in the beautiful stories, were just a wonderful contrast as usual. And the program called for the barbecue, and then I would uh, come up and make my opening remarks and introduce Eddie Arnold, who would sing his songs, and then I would introduce the vice president, who would make his remarks, welcome Ayub Khan of Pakistan, and he would come up, and that would basically be the program. Problem is, we forgot to tell the, the vice president what the program was. So halfway through the meal, he came to me and says, uh, introduce me, Cactus. I said, it's not time to introduce you. He says, introduce me. I said, I'd love to introduce you. <laughs> and I did, and then he made his remarks and then called Ayub Khan up on the stage and uh, presented him a Stetson hat, and he responded. And then they got in the golf course and headed off with about half the press corps and half the audience uh, following him. And I introduced Eddie Arnold, who sang to the back of about 400 important heads. <laughs> I saw Eddie Arnold at the Las Vegas airport a few years ago, and he said, I'm still voting Republican. <laughs> Another call from Liz one time. She says, we want you to fly to Albany, Texas, and audition the town. They have what they call an Albany Fandangle. It's a musical, and we're going to be entertaining some ambassadors from the United Nations with the barbecue, and uh, I want you to go check them out, see if they would be appropriate. I called my travel agent, and they said, no one flies to Albany, Texas. Braniff doesn't, nor does Trans Texas. But Les Reedy did in his small airplane, and Les and I flew to Albany, Texas, landed out by the school grounds. And the whole damn town was there on horseback and wagon and buckboards and covered wagons. They even had a homemade calliope that was there on the school grounds. And before only Les Reedy and me, they presented their entire Albany Fandangle. And you ain't Fandangled until you Fandangle in Albany. <laughs> they had Indians on horseback, they had cowboys that were shooting guns and pistols, singing wonderful songs, and it was a tremendous show. And when they finished, I said, folks, you can't believe how relieved I am to see what talent you do have. Because with all of you mounted and armed, I wouldn't have the guts to tell you you can't come to the LBJ Ranch. <laughs> uh, they did come, and it was a, a wonderful, wonderful success. Another call from Liz Carpenter. Whenever Liz called, I always knew something was up, that there was going to be a lot of work, and also it was going to be a lot of fun. And it's still that way and I'm still happy whenever she calls. This time, uh, she said, uh, we, we're going to give another barbecue for another head of state. We want some appropriate entertainment, and uh, it's going to be uh, in just a few days. So we thought about what entertainment we might have and decided that it would be a good idea to cap get Captain Billy McElroy, who taught the Texas Rangers how to shoot, to put on an exhibition of his expert uh, Western marksmanship. And he does do incredible things with the gun. And the day before the barbecue, we were down by the, the Ferdinellis under the big oak trees preparing. The uh, Secret Service, of course, with justification, were concerned that there might be an accident, so we were crossing every T and dotting every I as far as safety was concerned. And about that time, we heard the, uh, the honking of a horn and looked up and there was a, uh, a pickup roaring down to us. And the driver was frantically honking the horn, had his head out the window shouting words that we couldn't hear. When he got close enough, we recognized the driver as Dale Malachek, the foreman of the LBJ ranch. And then we heard the words. He said, the president has been shot in Dallas. The president has been shot in Dallas. Well, we all rushed up to the, the ranch house and went into the kitchen where uh, <laughs> a little TV set, still sets on top of the uh, refrigerator. And the familiar face and voice of Walter Cronkite was reporting the, the dastardly deeds of, of that day. We learned the results before the nation did because one of the Secret Service men came into the kitchen from the communication shack behind the house and said, you're now standing in the house of the President of the United States. Well, we all stood there stunned with the rest of the world. Finally, Mary Davis, who was a Johnson cook, took a hot pad and opened the oven door and pulled out two pecan pies. She said, these were to have been for the president. What do I do with them now? And Bess Abel, who went on to become social secretary of the White House, said, well, 
wrap them in aluminum foil, and we'll take them to Washington with us. I had been scribbling my opening remarks for the following day during the morning, and I suddenly realized that I had those notes still in my hand, and they were all crumpled up. I unfolded them. You might recall that a few days prior to that, a few weeks prior to that uh, tragedy, Adelaide Stevenson had been in Dallas and had been attacked by a little old lady with a parasol. And it made humorous stories and uh, headlines all over the world. And in lieu of that, uh, because of that, I read my opening remarks and they said, Mr. President, we're happy to see that you survived Dallas. In retrospect, uh, a very lousy joke. A few weeks later, another call from Liz Carpenter. She said, the president is going to have a dinner, a first affair of state for the chancellor of Germany and the cabinets of both, uh, both men. And let's get a program of entertainment that uh, will entertain them. But let's also use this as an opportunity to show the world that Texas is not just country music. So we called Van Cliburn. We called Van Cliburn's mother. <laughs> you always call Van Cliburn's mother and ask if he would come down and perform on a platform underneath the big oak trees by the Perdinellis River. And he consented to come. But uh, then we thought, well, it might rain, so we better move it inside the Stonewall Gymnasium, which necessitated removing the wall from the Stonewall Gymnasium, and uh, also resulted in Mrs. Clyburn getting in a very high state of anxiety because she didn't want her son playing for a barn dance. Uh, we crossed that bridge, but uh, there was going to be a, a stag dinner for Earhart and, and the cabinets and the president in the, in the ranch house. Did some research and learned that uh, Earhart was a musicologist. So we procured a string quartet from the Austin Symphony Orchestra and a young lady who had won the Miss Texas uh, pageant a few months before and then went on to win the talent competition in the Miss America contest. Her name is Linda Loftus, possessed a beautiful operatic voice. And when I suggested this to the State Department, they would hear none of it. We cannot have a beauty contestant entertaining the Chancellor of Germany and the President of the United States. You, you just can't do it. Liz Carpenter said, we will do it, and we did it. Uh, the evening of the dinner, the distinguished guests were in the dining room uh, the string quartet was in the living room, outside the, the dining room, playing the music. About halfway through the, the meal, the president comes out and said, don't these guys know what you think, Peppy? <laughs> Can't they play Yellow Rose of Texas or Deep in the Heart of Texas? I said, not unless Mozart composed it, Mr. President. <laughs> then after the meal, here comes the president of the United States, the chancellor of Germany and their cabinets, and I realized just how tall the cotton had gotten. I had memorized my opening remarks in German, and the chancellor complimented me on my Italian. <laughs> and I presented Linda, and she would look just gorgeous that evening. She was a blonde, had blue eyes. She was wearing a hair and pigtails, and was wearing a German peasant costume. And she presented a, a, a program of German leader songs, and she was magnificent and the audience was captivated. She sang one aria, uh, One Fine Day from Madame Butterfly. And after her performance, the chancellor got up and walked over to the vase and picked a yellow rose and presented to her and kissed her hand and said, that is the most wonderful program of German leader songs I've ever heard outside of Germany. And how did you know my very favorite Italian opera aria? Just sheer luck. Then the German chief of staff stood and he said, not Chief of Staff, the Secretary of State. He said, when I was a young man, I attended a concert in Berlin of a child prodigy pianist. It was the most remarkable performance I've ever heard in my life. I've often wondered what happened to that, that young man. Tonight I have discovered it is Miss Loftus' accompanist, Maestro Ezra Rockton of the Austin Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> Serendipity run amok. I looked out at the window opening to the porch. As I said, it was a stag affair. And there stood Mrs. Johnson peering through the window, taking it all in <laughs> like a little girl at Christmas in her own home. 
I want to thank you, Mr. Johnson, for allowing me to chop in that cotton and uh, to ride the Perdinalis with you because they've been wonderful. I think those are very important uh, affairs, those barbecues. First of all, they, they showed the best of Texas, the beauty of the hill country. And they were so warm in hospitality, people from all walks of life, all costumes, all races, melding so beautifully underneath those gorgeous trees. Uh, as, as Secretary of State Dean Russ said, I think James Davis and his barbecued ribs did more for diplomacy than all of the striped pants in Washington, D.C. <laughs> it was a very special occasion. Okay, I've gone a long time without a commercial. I know that makes you nervous. So it's commercial time. Friends, banking is a matter of friendship. And on Austin's own downtown hometown chemical bank of North Carolina, <laughs> you have not only a friend, but a neighbor as well. We're Austin's oldest federal bank. For three months we've been serving you now. <laughs> Try our new special services department. Open a new account with our Catholic priest teller. De <laughs> deposit your money and confess how you got it at the same time. Come in and visit with our friendly loan officers like Osaki Mishimoto, <laughs> Pietro Marconi, Ting Dung, good old boys who like to talk ice hockey and codfish fishing with you. We're Austin's own downtown hometown chemical bank in North Carolina, formerly the North Dakota Bank of South Dakota, <laughs> the Wyoming Cow Chips Bank of Southern Climb, the John Conley Ben Barnes Last Shot Bank, the David Mac Williams Up Your University Bank, <laughs> and the Alaska Yellow Snow and Kiss My Frozen Assets Bank. <laughs> That's the Austin Downtown Hometown Chemical Bank in North Carolina, owned by the Remember Hiroshima Corporation of Tokyo. <laughs> Only slightly kidding. Well, when Liz Carpenter, and you might have gathered Liz is one of my very favorite people on earth, when she wrote her book, Getting Better All the Time, a classic work of fiction, <laughs> she, <laughs> she organized the Getting Better All the Time Singers, unified denial. <laughs> but wherever she went to sell her books, to, they went along with her and they sang songs and they were highly entertaining and they continue to do so and have only gotten better and better with time and now just to, our professional, we should have them up here on this stage and we probably will. Uh, but we'd get together once a month and still do whenever the moon is full to howl at the moon. Sad when you get an age when a full moon only makes you want to howl. <laughs> but everyone is required to participate at these gatherings and uh, you either read a poem about the moon or sing a song about the moon or tell a story about the moon. And uh, one year I wrote a poem about the moon and Mrs. Johnson was kind enough to say that she liked it and I thought I would share it with you again tonight. So we have a little class in the program. And it goes like this. I see the moon, the moon sees me. God bless the moon, God bless me. From childhood to nohood, you share your shine with us. My granddaughter's first words came and were about you at Port Aransas when you came floating out of the gulf from behind the North Jetties, peeking out first like a giant ball head, and then rising a perfect orange balloon up to where the lights turn white. And Allison said her first sentence ever, I see the moon. How sweet a moon, how soft a moon to inspire a child's first words, their first drawings, their first wonderment and questioning. Where does it come from? Where does it go when it goes away? How does it grow? Why does it get smaller? What is it made of? Can I go there? Can I see it? Is it further than downtown? How does it stay up? Children love you. You must be a good moon. And yet, damn you, moon. You damn, damn moon. You bomber's moon. You moon of war. 
damn you for illuminating and eliminating, for filling the sky with romantic light that took away the darkness of the night and exposed my brothers to the guns below and washed away the shelter black and made the below like the above, a coal white light that invited the bombs to their targets where mothers and fathers slept with their children and their dreams that were shattered, their lives that were scattered into many tiny pieces of matter. Damn you, moon. You damn, damn bomber's moon. You hypocritical, apocalyptical, romantical, mythical, faithless moon of war. Damn you for allowing your soft light to turn the night into hell. Damn you for allowing the murmur of lovers by the lakes, the song sung to your beauty, the haunting calls of night birds, the mating croak of frogs and insects. Damn you, croon moon, spoon moon, for turning June moon to December moon, for drowning the hum of night creatures with the deadly hum of bombers' engines, that monotonous melody, the same sustained notes at first so pianissimo, like a gentle breeze that quietly moves the leaves and tenderly ripples the water, but then swells and rises and crashes into a crescendo of screams that descend like bats of hell down your beams, Valkyries. And then the timpani, the horrible timpani, the echoing timpani, the crashing, bashing, mashing, smashing timpani, the lethal fortissimo. Damn your symphony, you bomber's moon. And then, fickle ball of light, how sweetly you illuminate the soft white of thighs and breast in the darkness of the night. How lovingly you cover the scars of day with a benevolent coat of dimming light. The water that roared and crashed now so still, so soft, so serene. Calmed by your magical strands of yellow, lying like a blanket of woman's hair on the breast of a lover. How happily you light the path for the horses and shoot your lice off the jingling sleigh bells. How safe you make the way. How kindly, how friendly, how caring you replace the day. You move us up, you moving moon. Move us to move upward to you. Move the water up to us. Move the crazes in our minds out. Move our body tides to ebb and flow. Move our voices to sing and shout and scream and dream and howl and yowl and come together to worship you and to mutter into our pillows, our lonely pillows late at night and life even as long before. I see the moon. The moon sees me. God bless the moon. God bless me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we're going to have the moving pictures. I thought you might be interested in seeing uh, some highlights from... Um, one of the headliners roast, and also for a roasting of Robert Strauss that Governor Ann and I did in Washington, D.C. I say that. Actually, I needed an excuse to leave and change into costume for the next bit. So without further ado, roll the motion picture. Sorry, I don't have any popcorn. <laughs> so here we go again. Uh, we invited here tonight all the uh, living Texas governors as well as Dolph Briscoe. <laughs> um, uh, Governor White pleaded a very important conflict. This is a night that uh, Dr. Ruth is lecturing on middle-aged crisis on television. <laughs> now it's my pleasure to present the executioners and their victims. I will introduce them in order of ascending IQ. First, the governor of Texas. <laughs> Come on up, Ada. <laughs> right over there, governor. Which side do you want me on? Uh, right here, good guy. <laughs> governor, you can just sit down if you would, please. <laughs> you, you come on later. I come on later? Later, huh? You know, you don't really amuse me. <laughs> Well, Governor, <laughs> well, Governor I'd, 
I'd just like to say you damn sure amuse me. <laughs> no, I, I'm really fond of this man. You, you'd have to go all the way to Arizona to find a, find a governor. <laughs> Someone once said, Bob Strauss is the best qualified man in the nation to be president. It was Bob Strauss who said that. <laughs> One morning when he was shaving, he looked in the mirror and said, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's most presidential of all? And the mirror replied, Robert, Robert, when you shave, cut your throat and America is saved. <laughs> Here he is, Robert. I'll fly first class till they offer something better. Strauss, right there. <laughs> we were anxious to get the Secretary of the Treasury, James Baker, here before the next grand jury convenes in Washington. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of the Treasury, James Baker. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the most effective woman politician in Texas since Ma Ferguson, <laughs> Treasurer Ann Richards, right there. Let us bring you up to date by reviewing the news headline stories and the headline makers of the year just past. Max Nofzinger has been referred to by some of his detractors as the flower power councilman, primarily because he once sold flowers on a street corner. Councilman Nofzinger, I'm sure this derogatory portrayal of you must be painful. Would you please describe for us your real political philosophy? Water, sunshine, and air all work together to create life. <laughs> Wish he were kidding. <laughs> Governor Bill Clements, you are known for your clear, incisive, forceful manner of speaking. Would you repeat after me? I think that there will be multiple occasions on a continuing basis. I think that uh, there will be uh, multiple occasions. No. No, no, Governor, you, you didn't quite get it. It's multiple. Try it again, please. I think that uh, there will be uh, multiple. No, 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 no. The word is multiple, Governor, now, not multi. The word is multiple. Now, let's try it one more time, please. I think that uh, there will be uh, multiple. Forget it. <laughs> Just forget it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, actually one of the sweetest, nicest, loveliest, tenderhearted, kindest speaking women I've ever known, Ann Richards. <laughs> He's not going to get off easy. Well, as Henry VIII said to one of his wives, this won't take long. <laughs> you know, if Cactus Pryor had to make an honest living, he couldn't run a highway watermelon stand if they gave him the melons in a highway patrol flag traffic. <laughs> We have a very special surprise guest with us this evening. And in deference, uh, I'm going to give him a straight introduction. Visiting in Washington this week is a friend of Bob's from Great Britain. He is Sir Gilbert Peake, 
of St. Albans, England. Sir Gilbert is a member of Parliament with the reputation of being one of that body's most eloquent and witty spokesmen. The Peaks and the Strausses have visited each other on either side of the Atlantic for a number of years. So when we learned that he was going to be in town, we invited him to come and give us a view of Robert Strauss as perceived in the mother country. And speaking of mother, Sir Gilbert and Mrs. Peake are proof positive that there will always be an England. They are the parents of three sets of twins, plus two other children. I give you the gifted and the prolific <laughs> Sir Gilbert Peake. Madam Treasurer, you are a tribute to the weaker sex. <laughs> I really hadn't expected you to divulge my family status, but uh, since you have, now you know why I travel. <laughs> my wife won't allow me to come home. <laughs> I suppose genetically we are a catastrophe, and she often refers to me as a non-violent James Bond. <laughs> Someone once said, three sets of twins. My God, you must have had twins every time. I should know there were just hundreds of times when we didn't have anything at all. <laughs> uh, we revere the warm friendship that exists between our two countries as personified by uh, Prime Minister Thatcher and, and President Reagan. As a matter of fact, we refer to Prime Minister Thatcher as a thinking Ronald Reagan. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I jest, actually, he's one of our very favorite actors. Uh, <laughs> they seem to share similar social attitudes. They both have declared that slavery is tacky. Uh, <laughs> that homosexuals shouldn't be pistol-whipped unless they get uppity. <laughs> I'm told that President Reagan opposes abortion. Prime Minister Thatcher has taken a more conciliatory attitude and has made virginity retroactive. As, uh... <laughs> to which I'm sure Senator Hart would say, here, here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to let you give him another hand because I want to introduce Cactus Pryor from Austin, Texas, who was Lyndon Johnson's favorite comedian. And that tells you a lot more about Lyndon than it does about Cactus. Would you welcome back to the microphone Cactus Pryor? Just want to say howdy, friends and neighbors, and hook them horns. <laughs> My name is Cactus Pryor, and you've just been took by another damn Texan. <laughs> I would like to say, however, I had some very interesting conversations as I was introduced around at the cocktail party as Sir Gilbert Peake. I would like to thank Mr. Bill Crotty from Florida for telling me about the Alamo. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll, you'll be interested to learn that's where we won our independence. <laughs> and Jim McIntyre from Atlanta told me how the game of football is played. I think it takes a lot of guts for Atlanta Falcons man to tell a Dallas Cowboy man how to play football. I got to talking to Senator Russell Long over at the table, and I said, you know, Mr. Long, we passed a law in Parliament that no member of Parliament, after he has served, can represent any firm regarding legislation. Don't you think it would be a good idea if it were that way here in America? I don't know his politics, but he ain't no socialist, friends. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Paul Simon remembered meeting me in London. <laughs>
My name's J. Frank Doby. I was born in the middle of 7,000 acres of Live Oak County in Brush Country in a three room rock house. Always had a sort of a wonderful ambivalence in my life. I was torn between the world of cattle and the world of books. So I compromised. I wrote books about the world of cattle. I was also a professor at the University of Texas here. My home was right down there on Waller Creek. And I taught at Cambridge during the war. I suppose I had the reputation of being a maverick. I was always nipping at the pompous butts of the academicians and the politicians. Like when they erected that high university tower building over there. I said I couldn't understand the region's preoccupation with up when we got so much out in Texas. Told me I ought to lay it on its side and let it run along Guadalupe Street. Put a veranda on it. I'll tell you one thing, if the height of that building had been determined by the IQ of the region that built it, it'd have to be an underground structure. <laughs> and they were always railing at me to get my PhD. Professor Doby, you need to get your PhD. Get your PhD. Hell, I'd rather have VD than a PhD. <laughs> At least you can cure VD. Writing a PhD thesis is simply an exercise in transferring dry bones from one graveyard to another. They're taking the universal out of the universities. They're becoming myopic in the view. It's all about money making, not mind making. While you look at your list of boards of regents and distinguished alumni, reads like who's who on the New York Stock Market Exchange. Those people care much about a classical university education as a, a Razorback hog cares about Keats owed on a Grecian urn. A university should make more than a hireable hand. It should create a civilized person who understands the world in which he lived. A good teacher knows that actually he can't teach. But what he can do is inspire a student to want to learn and show him how to learn. He not only opens his mind, but he reaches in and touches his very soul, gives him the wings to soar like a, like a red-tailed hawk into the limitless realms of knowledge. God, what a privilege. What a gift to give. Now, my subject was life and literature in the Southwest. My, I, I taught about the Chisholm Trail, the, the Rawhide, herding songs. But I always thought it was just as important to talk about challenging established attitudes regarding race, political ideologies, university administrations. Now the, the joy of a liberated mind that's what a university should be about. Well, I traveled many miles sitting around campfires down in South Texas, listening to the tales of the cowboys and the vaqueros and rode the mountains of Mexico on mule back. But I was never, never alone because I always had a good traveling companion. I brought him with me tonight. You might have met at him before. Jack Daniels. <laughs> Let's deal with the antidote before we get to the affliction. You know, I think I could drink Jack Daniels whiskey with a Republican PhD from Texas A&M, feel good about it. <laughs> Well, as old John Lomax used to say, here's to you and toward you. Hadn't seen you, wouldn't know you. Here's hope you live always, and I never die. 
I like old Senator Tom Connolly's toast, too. He, he used to say, I stood by mighty Niagara Falls and been baptized by the awesome plume of that magnificent cascade. Stood on the shores of California and watched the mighty Pacific come softly ashore and kiss the sandy beaches like a gentle lover. Stood on the rock-bound coast of Maine and seen the storm-tossed Atlantic and load its cargo of foam and spume, transported all the way from the English Channel. I've seen water never form, but as a drink, damn sorry substitute for a shot of Jack Daniel whiskey. <laughs> you ever stop to think that Jack Daniels might have been the greatest American ever lived? Brought more politicians together in perfect accord. Brought more Methodists and Catholics together in perfect harmony. Brought more Baptists together in perfect secrecy. <laughs> well, as I said, uh, I taught about the Chisholm Trail, the true West, not the West told by that damn Dennis Zane Gray, about as authentic as a bowl of vegetarian chili. Real West was hard. I suppose probably never told better than a song about Little Joe the Wrangler. Sing me the opening verse of it, Liz. Here's a year ago last April that he joined the outfit here, just a little Texas straying all alone. They were taking a herd of longhorns up the trail, Chisholm Trail from South Texas to Abilene, Kansas. Little Joe was just nubbing about 16 years old. But he was born on horseback, and that was his main job to look after the remuda. Well, sir, one day that was, one night that was as dark as two day old chuck wagon coffee, they were bedded down on the Red River. It was as still as a West Texas Creek in July, sort of a clammy silence in the air. Tumbleweeds lined like becalm sailing schooners. Milky Way overhead, too tired to put out but a dab of light. Cattle were listless too, the cows lying quietly chewing the cuds. Few steers that were standing, not even bothering to swish their tail as insects weren't even bothering to fly. But then the cattle started milling around, clacking their horns. The cowboys knew the eyes they couldn't see were wild eyes. Something was happening. Something was on the way. Trail boss heard the commotion and ordered, all hands to the herd, Little Joe included. Then on the far horizon, the trouble became apparent. A huge knife sliced the inky blackness, and a ragged white scar slashed across the sky. A low rumble came tumbling after, and a low rumble came oozing out of the nervous longhorns. The tumbleweeds began filling their sails and started skittering across the prairie in blind terror. Now a whole wall of blue-white streaks of lightning was rolling down on the herd like a, like a giant tidal wave. The thunder that had been rumbling was now explosions of angry sky. Cattle were bellowing a course of pure panic. Pellets of rain riding a frantic wind were peppering the cowboys and the horses like, like birds shot at close range. The cattle got to their feet and started running, and then stampeding. The storm was above them, below them, among them. Balls of fire were playing on the tips of the longhorns and on the tips of the horses' ears. Snakes of fire crawled over the backs of the cattle and, and darted through the manes of the cowboys' mounts. You could smell burning hide and hair like a branding in hell. Ride for the lead! Ride for the lead! Get in front! Turn them! Turn them so they begin to circle! Little Joe was riding a fast horse, carrying a light load. Not even the wind could catch him. He passed acres of longhorns, all running at top speed. 
Turn them, boys, turn them. Joe was getting water all over. They were throwing buckets of water in his face as he was nearing the lead long horn steer. But the wind kept blowing, and the rain was blowing, and the lightning was flashing. It was just like hell on earth. Faster, boys, get in front and turn them. Turn them so they begin to circle. Joe turned his horse into the side of a lead lanky longhorn to move him over. But his horse found a hole, and down he went. Joe went sailing over his head, his little body becoming a part of the mud and the rain and the hooves. The storm went roaring on down the canyon, its anger echoing off the wall, but growing fainter and fainter and fainter. And soon the only sound you could hear was little Joe gasping for each breath. And then he gasped his last. It was little Joe the Wrangler you wrangle never more. His days with the old Bermuda, they are done. Now, if that don't make you a vegetarian, I don't know what in the hell will. <laughs> well, I'm proud to be here. One of the proudest moments of my life was when Lyndon Johnson gave me the the Medal of Freedom, in Washington, D.C. And I remind you that the courage to be free has to be recaptured by every succeeding generation. I'm in a freer pasture now with my wild Mustangs. I wrote about them once, the only poem I ever wrote in, in the Mustangs. I see them running, 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 from the Spanish caballados to be free, from the Mustangers' ropes and rifles to stay free, or seas of pristine grass, like fire dancers on the mountain, like lightning playing against the unapproachable horizon. I see them standing, 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 sentinels of alertness of eye and nostril, each toss of a main neck, a Grecian grace. Each high snort, bugling out the pride of the free. I see them vanishing, vanishing, vanished. The seas of grass shriveled into pens of barbed wire property. The wind drinkers and the wind racers bred into property also. But wind still bow free and grass still grows green. And the core of that something that men live on believing is always freedom. So sometimes yet in the reality of silence and solitude, a few people unhampered a while by things, the Mustang walks out at dawn, stands tall, and then sweeps away, wild with sheer life, and free, 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 free of all confines of time and flesh.